Hey guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 284, featuring the first in a brand new series of interviews with Joe and Hannah of Well Not Studios, the developers behind the upcoming game Serpent in the Staglands. Now, a lot of you guys had written in uh, asking me, or telling me about the game and seeing if I uh, was interested in talking to uh, the developers, and I'm really glad I followed up on that. A uh, really, really great people, and it's a really, really fun interview. <laughs> I mean, uh, this is one of the, uh, my favorites, actually. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Joe and Hannah. Hello, folks. I am here with Hannah and the lovely Joe Williams of uh, <laughs> Well Not Studios. Now, Hannah, you're expertise uh, really speaks for its uh speaks for itself but joe i gotta gotta ask joe uh come on are you a real gamer yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know i just i just sit here and doodle all day and then you know does all the heavy lifting <laughs> all right so these two are uh from a studio called well not studios they're based in chicago i believe yes that's right uh, so they're currently working on a game called serpent in the staglands which they call a uh, quote, true role-playing adventure. Uh, that's an, I thought that was an interesting tagline, so I'm kind of wondering, now are you implying there that you don't think Dragon Age and Skyrim are true <laughs> RPGs? Or are they just vicious lies? Sure, no, not at all. I think there's, there's certainly different, uh, you know, categories of role-playing games, and I guess our genre, we thought, um, or what we're doing, kind of, Combines adventure games, kind of like maybe an old Indiana Jones or Myst or something, with you know role playing experience, more tabletop infused role playing experience. Hmm, so you got some adventure game elements in there. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah, think. lots of puzzles and lots of detective work, trying to figure out what's going on in the world, having to pay attention to clues more so than things being handed to you. So you're thinking sort of a Legend of Grimrock sort of thing. A little bit. Um, it's not as much of a dungeon crawl, I guess. A lot of the narrative elements are also kind of um, put together, kind of like a puzzle. Uh, you start the game without much help, and you kind of have to um, find the pieces of the puzzle, kind of what's going on before you got there as a player, and kind of what's going on during. And, so um, am I going to be able to figure this thing out, or I'm going to be stuck in the <laughs> in the beginner's area? I think, Matt, with I think water wings on. Yeah. I'm going to be okay. I think you yeah. will. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, you know, one of the things I usually don't spend a lot of time talking about on, on my show, you know, I re review a lot of computer role-playing games and stuff, but usually I'm not all that impressed with the story, you know, part of the, these games. I mean, you've played a few, I'm sure. You know, I think that uh, I could sum it up, sum up the storyline of about 90% of role-playing games, something like this. Repair the all-powerful orb by gathering up the 16 and a half pieces and conveniently distributed across the various regions <laughs> and defeat the evil wizard and put an end to the eternal winter. Sure. Now, I don't well, that never gets old, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds, uh, I mean, you've got something totally uh, totally new. You're going way off that cliche path, right? So tell me a little bit about the story of the game. Yeah, well, I guess we've tried to. Um, I, I think if we were to relate the story, or I guess the narrative to anything, um, I think like a game like Myst is just ingrained into at least my subconscious, and I think that kind of formed a lot of it, where you just dropped on an island. So you got two brothers trapped in a book. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. No, we know. Family problems, you know. But our game, you're role-playing as a god, and you've come down for this festival. It's a festival that celebrates you, and um, you're kind of a philanderer. A philanderer? Just, yeah, you know, you just, uh -oh. <laughs> you just have you fun. You don't help them a lot. You yeah. just kind of go down to relax. And... Yeah, you like to party at their solstice festivals. You stay up on your moon. Yeah. Um, so you said I, I get to play up. as a god? Yes. Yeah. I, mean, so so I, just, I can just push a button then and all the bad guys just go away? Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, normally, except you're trapped in a mortal form because you can't return back to your moon. And so the story starts from there where you're stuck on the Staglands, which is a peninsula, and... Um, oh, God, neither had to be some kind of catch to that. Just sounded <laughs> yeah. too good to be true. You didn't have that cheat <laughs> activated uh, right to start the game. Yeah, so you don't have a lot of ideas why you're there. You don't have a lot of known enemies, in, um, but clearly someone has it out for you, so you're running around trying to figure out what's happening and 
getting some companions. Yeah, you have to people. you have one priest that kind of helps you out at the beginning, but he can't do a lot for you. He says, you know, I, I doubt I can keep you safe in this little temple. And so he kind of gives you the boot, and then from there you're pretty much on your own. You're not supposed to be able to trust anybody, and so you really have to either, you know, Sherman's march your way through the whole game and try to figure things out that way or try to kind of stay undercover because you don't want people to know who you are. Hmm. So kind of. So there's not a lot spelled out for you at the beginning of the game. Then you just have no. to you have to sort of figure out what's going on. As you, well, I like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, one thing that I do think though is key to just about any CRPG. If it's a good CRPG, I think one of the main reasons that I like it is because it has a really good setting. You know, really a great game world. I want to get in there and explore. I don't even need to have a quest to make me go look at different <laughs> places. You know, I'm like, well, that, what is that over there? You know. Yeah. And I go check that out, and I was really uh, intrigued by the stuff that I've seen you say about the, and stuff I've seen in the in the videos and so on about uh, Serpent in the Staglands, because you're talking about a Romanian, sort of Transylvanian uh, kind of theme to it, and uh, you mentioned Bram Stoker, who of course wrote a book about a vampire. Uh, I haven't heard of that <laughs> What was the name of that vampire? Yeah. <laughs> uh uh, so I'm thinking, is this sort of a Ravenloft? Would it be out of place thinking of Ravenloft? Um, I got. I mean, it it takes on a. Um, it's a little mystical, I guess, and that it, you know, we have spells and all that, but it's it's pretty grounded as far as um, the setting. You know, it's pretty. It's in a Bronze Age. Yeah, what does like, that mean exactly? A, a Bronze Age. I mean, what what we expect from that? No. I think that has to do more with the kind of weapons and armor, and um, your equipment more so than anything. I mean, medieval looks pretty. It's pretty medieval in terms of the setting, but we tried to go into pretty heavy detail. We took some, I guess, some inspiration from Darklands, from something like that, where we wanted the setting to be. Um, you know, kind of fully realized, and we, we did a lot of research to make sure all the weapons you're using and stuff like that, you can really kind of get a grasp on. And You know, the Bronze Age isn't something that's really uh, looked at in a lot of video games, um, and we thought that'd be kind of fun to throw people into that kind of world. We wanted to, originally, we kind of wanted to have a system where you could bend and break your swords, kind of like a, a brutal durability system for everything. That's what <laughs> I was wondering. Is it going to be sort of weapons degrading all the time? And yeah, replacing? you have to bend it and... We decided our game was already hard enough without <laughs> yeah. that extra element. That might not have been fun. Um, but I think it's also in the details, like there's straw mattresses at the inn and people don't have pillows because they didn't have pillows. And yeah. Trying to incorporate all these little things that... They didn't have pillows. Yeah, apparently um, we were reading about it and only sick women in the poorer <laughs> classes were <laughs> used pillows. I mean, if you were a nobleman or a... Bro, I think that, that's probably the fact of the podcast right there. <laughs> the fact of the video. No pillows. Wow. That really yeah. would suck. But, yeah, in Eastern European setting, we were kind of excited about doing that. That was your idea to kind of throw into a new kind of territory. We don't see a lot in CRPGs. So it's based on actual Earth geography then? No, no, no it's no. not. It's um, a world that we made up, but we're using some kind of linguistics... Languages from Eastern European, researched medieval Slavic names, those kind of things. Love the environments and names. Yeah, it's more just about setting this tone and setting this kind of consistent environment mm. that we wanted to have. I thought I saw somewhere where you said that you had even uh, found some actual curses. You know, <laughs> yeah, we, I, I'm I, uh, really curious. You know, I've got, you know, I guess it's probably safe for you too, right? Uh, oh, probably. Can you just give me a couple? Where are they? Um, I mean, they say a lot of things like um, by the eye of the god or the teeth of the god or things like that. Um, which by the teeth of the gods! Just like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Some easy bandit quips right there when they did yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but I really like I really like all the curses, like calling people strumpets and wenches and... Strumpets? Boot lickers and yeah. um, all sorts of colorful language. They didn't use a lot of go-to yeah. cuss words, I guess, as we know on the yeah. day, so we got to be pretty... A lot of adjectives, creative. you know, the yeah. more adjectives, like, you boil-brained, milk-livered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. so sort of a Black Adder-like vibe to it. Yeah. 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 Alright, so here's a question from a viewer. 
And I've got a couple dozen viewers who watch the show, and you know sometimes they'll send in questions on Twitter. Oh, great. And here's one. Uh, this is JP. It looks like Kuna to me. I don't know. I'm probably mispronouncing that. But anyway, he asks, uh, will the game focus more on exploration, or will it have a healthy number of quests and NPCs? Um, well, I guess both. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we do have a healthy number of NPCs, and there are plenty of things to do. But exploration is, I feel like we're really pushing exploration from the beginning, especially mm -hmm. by not giving you a lot of hints of where to go. There's, there's not really an indicator on the screen anywhere that you're actively doing a quest, but there's a lot of things for you, you know, to be doing. Uh, you know, people give you, um, you're disguised as a spicer, and so often you could come across kind of shady people that want spices delivered to different districts, and you kind of have to dodge uh, the arbiters or the guards on, like, taxes and bridges and stuff, and you have to mm -hmm. try to get through with that. A spicer is a spice merchant in our world. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you sent me some comments about that, right? So you thought... Being a spice merchant, being a spice merchant, having that trade or job, is uh, well, it's definitely. I don't. Other than Dune, I don't really know what type <laughs> comes up. You know, with spice merchants. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we thought that if you were going to be in disguise in a world, what better way to get around and have access to different places and different things than to be a merchant? Mm -hmm. And so we thought that was kind of almost realistic in a very non-realistic setting. So what kind uh, of spices did they have back then? What are, um, well, they have spices to season food, and spices that like we have salt, a lot. Of salt is like an exotic spice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Yeah, we okay. we're gonna have a whole um, glossary of spices in yeah. our oh. journal. A lot of the a lot of the districts kind of um, block certain spices because they try to get a lot of taxes on them. And so your whole if you're kind of going into these kind of sub quests like that is try try to get through and do that. And a lot of the spices aren't even really spices; they're more exotic goods. Mm -hmm. You know, that take on a little more of the Transylvanian vibe, you know, like virgin blood or, or kind of like silkworm kind of things. And Any garlic powder? Is that strictly off? Uh, oh, we do have mushroom powder. powder. That is illegal. <laughs> <laughs> mushroom powder. <laughs> I'm getting hungry thinking about all this. I mean, it sounds like it sounds like one of those rare games where you, you might actually play this and walk away with some actual knowledge. A lot of it's kind of fantasy-like, but we tried to, you know, infuse everything with at least a sense of kind of grounded realism. Yeah. Uh, Joe especially is kind of a, not a sword nerd. Grounded realism? But... Is that a pun on the whole? <laughs> <laughs> grounded real. Oh, yeah. I didn't even notice. <laughs> See, I pick up on things like that. You know. That's great. Anyway, Hannah, what were you uh, saying there? Oh, I was going to say, oh. Joe is a, um, he likes researching weapons and equipment and types of fabrics used in. He's gone through our inventory spreadsheet several times, and every time I look in there, he's added a couple more sentences to each of these descriptions about the type of fabric used. Make your life make your life hard doing that. I know. Yeah. So <laughs> if you if you like that kind of thing, if you like being immersed, um, that's kind of what we're going for. Well, that sounds great. And I noticed you said a couple times that you were inspired by the game Darklands. I don't know if you guys can see my copy back here. Oh, where do you have oh, that? Oh, very nice. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yes. Great game. I had uh, you know, I had Arnold J. Hendrick on the show before. I think I don't know if I sent you guys that. You did. Yeah. To those, but uh, you know that that game, you know, it seems like to the like the half dozen people or so who played it, <laughs> you know, they loved it. I mean, they talk about it. They, you know, they just really got obsessed about it. Uh, but let's face it, you know, it wasn't really a big mainstream. Yeah. success yeah. right so i'm just wondering you know what you know, what's uh what are you thinking really you know we're trying to uh you know follow that sort of uh, game uh wouldn't it make more sense to try to make another diablo 2 or something like that <laughs> i think you know there's still an audience for a thing you know games like dark lands or maybe some that didn't have a lot of mm -hmm. good reception when they first came out but i think too we didn't play it neither was played it when it came out because it was a little bit before our time but um I think it was made, what, in the early 60s? Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> I think it's 92. Yeah. Um, but I looked over at my computer one day, it's three or four years ago, I see Joe booting up a DOS simulator. I'm like, what are you... What are so you he does doing? play some games. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. That's... And he's like, I heard about this game, Darklands. And, you know, I scoot my chair over, and we see these gargoyles, like, very cheesy, flapping across the screen. <laughs> the five-minute <laughs> intro of Gargoyles. That was like what cutting is, edge back then, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah I bet. 
And, you know, uh, we started up and immediately die and I pull up the manual and we're kind of trying yeah. to navigate through this. And um, we just really liked it. We thought it was a fun setting. I feel like our characters were not as valiant as that character, but oh, yeah. oh very nice. I don't have the manual for it, but I'm sure it's nice and thick. <laughs> I grew up, you know, I grew up with those old, like the Indiana Jones, the old, you know, the original kind of adventure games from LucasArts and, and the Dig and all that. I see that, I see that back there too. Um, the Dig was great, and you know, I miss Darklands, but oh man, playing that even just a few years ago, that is such a just immensely charming game. Yeah, well, it's I hard. think for us too, since we our goal isn't necessarily to make. A mainstream amount of money. We just need enough money to make another game. We can do things like this. Yeah. Yeah, well, keep that in mind if you find yourself with some extra cash. <laughs> I we can, can live like the you. hermit monks in uh, Darklands. And... <laughs> so why are you making the players keep all their own uh, notes? And I think even I saw somewhere where they're even going to have to break out the old graph paper. <laughs> and color, oh, yeah, they colored could. pencils. They you know? We do have an overall map and a, mm -hmm. not a mini map. So. Oh, well, we, we, we don't really, uh, since it's not like a huge dungeon crawl, this isn't like uh, you know, Bard's Cell or something, we need to record all that. There, there is like a zoomed out version of your, your map you're on. We have an overworld map, but yeah, the, I guess the writing. So it your does, it does have a map then. It does have yeah. maps, although you often get hand maps from people who want things from you. Sure. So while there's an overall map, it's not littered with markers telling you where you should go. You have to listen to instructions. You have to reference these hand-drawn maps you get and put in your inventory that just are basically a treasure map has a big X yeah. where <laughs> you're supposed to be going. Can um, you put your own pins on the map and notes? Uh, we didn't do that. We have a journal you can write in. Yeah. Um, so our thinking was that if you have to write your own notes and we like doing this in games too we're not just trying to be cruel but if you <laughs> write your own notes and you shape these quests and um, these to-do lists in your own wording it becomes more of your own adventure and it just takes on a different picture than these pre-populated quest notifications because it's your take on it and for kind of the open-ended narrative that's happening and kind of the focus and exploration we thought that was an easy way to present that to the player because after so long after doing you know, quest checklist number, you know, 500. They bring, kind of bring six cardamoms to <laughs> Merchant Velivar. Is that Deliver sort of... pants. To, uh, <laughs> so. sure. But you don't like collecting bear asses anymore? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Has that gotten old? <laughs> I mean, it almost sounds to me, guys, uh, like you're making an assumption about the, the, the player of this game, right? It's, it's almost like you're assuming this is an intelligent person uh, that is able to solve some problems and keep some notes and apply <laughs> this thing in my skull. I mean, is that... Sure. Yeah. We'd I like think to think there's smart so. players still out there. That is that what you're shooting at, a certain demographic of uh, player? <laughs> yeah. I don't know so much a demographic in terms of age, <laughs> but maybe, maybe in terms so. of, yeah. of intelligence and willingness to get their hands dirty. I mean, this is not something that 16, 15, 16-year-olds are going to be interested in, right? I don't think so. I mean, Maybe. I have hope for 60-year-olds. <laughs> hope for the future, man. Come on. Like a 60-year-old, 70-year-old. I mean, sure. this will be a big hit in the senior citizen song. I mean, I guess even the art, um, you know, we very specifically chose to do that kind of art style just because, um, well, I, I liked, I'm a 2D artist, so I kind of was limited to doing something like that. But, you know, viewing that, you know, we tried to make it kind of like a kind of like a, you know, Bullet's Gate was 3D, but something like that, or Dark Clans. So the whole kind of feeling of the game is supposed to kind of inspire you to take a take a breath from current games and try to go back to something that was a little different. Yeah. Yeah, that was my first thought when I was looking at some of the screenshots of the game and the sort of style of it, not just this game, but some of the earlier ones you did too. I kept thinking of the some of the graphics I saw on the Amiga uh, computer back <laughs> in the day. I mean, it was it's not like it looks crude or anything. I mean, these are really, yeah. you know, nice images. It is kind of a distinctive style, I guess, and I've seen you saw it, you described it as sort of a timeless style. Sure. I wonder if you could elaborate a bit on that. I mean, because, I mean, there's got to be people that look at this and say, oh, look, you know, those graphics are so primitive, right, and they just don't get yeah. it. They just can't make that connection, right? So. <laughs> and if they didn't grow up with that, yeah, it's hard to blame them, because um, this does probably look crude. And, of course, now there's a lot of games that kind of use it as a, you know, kind of a retro, cool, 
you know, Super Nintendo nostalgic, nostalgic piece. kind of piece. But which we weren't trying to do. I mean, it is yeah. a nostalgic inspired game, but um, we're using a lot of things that aren't nostalgic, like rendering effects and things mm -hmm. we can do with our engine that are more modern, but we're pairing it with pixel art, which is... It's like a souped-up Amiga. <laughs> I mean, I, I like pixel art just fine, as long as you know sure. it's, a cho it's a choice people make, because they, yeah. like, they like it, uh, not because you know we couldn't afford anything better. <laughs> sure. And it's, you know, they're going to play the nostalgia card and try to get the you know, yeah, right. Super Nintendo crowd in, involved. Tried, tried to match it. You know, we have these you know limited color palettes and all that for all, for all the characters and stuff, but we kind of match it up with, like, having... You know, a walk cycle be you know ten frames or something, and so like a character's armor sheets, you know, those are ranging on you know, thousands of frames now. So we try to match it up with like a lot of animations. So we try to make it look, you know, as nice as pixel art, or at least that we can do for an isometric eight directional game. <laughs> yeah. Be so hopefully. Yeah, I was trying to decide looking at it if, you know, if I had a time machine, you know, like <laughs> at what year would this have been? Would this have looked, uh, yeah. you know, really cutting edge? Sure. It's kind of a mishmash of new things and old things. It's kind of hard to point, pinpoint. I would probably say maybe mid-90s or yeah, 93-ish. I don't know. I'd be kind of curious, guys, watching the video. You know, let us know. <laughs> I'd like to see your, your views. Sure. All right, so I was listening to your the podcast interview you did with old uh, Adam. Uh, that was uh, Fragments of Sil Silicone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or silicon. I always get that. Uh, confused, but anyway, I really liked the you know that interview was great. You guys were talking about in there how uh, you know you wanted the this real time with pause combat, and you you know made a very deliberate choice to go that that route rather than the turn based, which seems like that's kind of you know <laughs> cachet right now. Uh, and so I was trying to just wrap my head around how it's going to work in your game. You know, as I'm thinking it's a Baldur's Gate sort of approach, uh, but then, you know, you're talking about these cooldowns and charge-ups, and I almost imagine like a World of Warcraft <laughs> oh, uh, thing, so I'm just like, can you kind of just clarify this, how this combat's going to work? Sure. Yeah, well, there's not cooldowns, or um, there aren't charge-ups so much as waiting time attack speeds, um, mm. but it is real-time with pause, and is a little chaotic, but we do a lot of, a lot of the systems are set up, especially the, the combat, the fighter skills, where you equip three at a time, and that means, and they auto proc like every X number of hits, your skill will fire, or at the start of a battle, or if you're low on health. So you're not doing a lot of management during combat. It's kind of like you're prepping everything, and you have your wizards in the back, you know, knowing what they're gonna cast, and then you go for it. A lot of there's a lot of pre-buffing happening to make, especially mid and late game battles successful. Mm -hmm. So it's not like uh, <coughs> Skyrim, <coughs> no. <laughs> no. like having this big fight and then you suddenly you you have to eat right in the middle of the right in the middle of a punch. You know, you stop and eat 17 rutabagas, <laughs> get your health back up, and then you know you fall. Stop yeah, right. No, you have to. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. not possible. Well, what yeah. about the old problem with you know you get your fireball you know winding up and by the time that thing's ready to go, the the bad guys have already moved on to a different spot. <laughs> That can happen, sure. but we yeah. have a, I mean, you can definitely get your casting speed faster as you, you know, increase your, as you level up, so. Our spellcasters kind of use a different system. They don't, we actually don't really have any fireball kind of dispensers. We don't really have elemental magic, but instead you're, you're holding down a spell. So if you have something called like foul creep that kind of drains stats and does a little bit of damage, mm -hmm. you fire your wand at a target and then it. You're constantly holding that until you you change the damage the spell keeps rocking every. Yeah. Mm. It's kind of a duration seconds. for it. Yeah, so kind of a delayed kind of a de yeah, delayed gratification approach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It procs yeah. every few seconds. But some of those, room. I mean, sometimes it's nice because some of the spells um, they build up. It, the longer you hold them, the more output it'll do. So if you're lowering someone's dodge chances, um, it could continuously get worse and worse. So yeah. there's some payoff to hmm. the patience of having that. That was fun to play with that. Yeah. That certainly sounds interesting. Uh, so let's see. Here's another question. Uh, how many types of enemies are there? I mean, what kind of variety, I guess, is what? There's a lot right now. I think our list for monsters and kind of creatures is around 25 right now. Um, and that's that's just for, like, um, some unique 
um, uh, images and animations. So we don't have a lot of um, like different just color swaps for them yet. I'm sure we could put some more in, like there's fire imps and ice imps, and they're kind of the same thing, just colored differently. But we try to have a pretty big variety, and they're pretty interesting. The most you'll be fighting are other humans or mortals, bandits, outlaws. Yeah, getting some gangs, meeting yeah. some gangs of um, interesting mix. They all have your skills and spells too. So, um, and there is even one that we call them the skin stealers, and they take on all of your weapons and armor and skills and spells. So you're basically fighting yourself. Oh. Those are pretty fun. Yeah, it must have been a challenge to get the AI on monsters like that. <laughs> it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that really as hard as it sounds? Um, no, it wasn't too bad. Just have to it was, mirror them. <laughs> yeah, it was tricky. But you got some pretty clever tactics going on with the, the enemies. Yeah, some of them are, some of them have kind of unique things they do. We have uh, this race of creature called Shroomers, and they're underground, and they often, um, if there's holes anywhere around them, they could take attacks at you and then they'd run to a hole and then they'd Shroomer? Yeah. yeah. And then they'd run under <laughs> they'd be underground then and then they'd pop up in a different hole. They're kind of a reptile y No relation to trimmer. <laughs> no. no, they're like uh they're, they're like little humanoid reptiles. Yeah. Yeah, they live in mushrooms. Yeah. Live in mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> but most of the monsters we don't we don't really have the typical I guess we have a goblin, but we don't really have the typical D and D variety. We try to keep it based on a lot of um, folklore. Folklore, like Romanian and Transylvanian kind of folklore kind of stuff. And that was kind of interesting. Yeah, well, I, I have heard, that's bound to be, you know, a lie, uh, but a very nasty rumor, guys. Uh, just uh, something horrible <laughs> about your game. You know, something missing, a creature that's actually missing <laughs> oh. uh, in the game. I don't even want to uh, lend credence to this. <laughs> Uh, this rumor because I just can't imagine. <laughs> but uh, I think I know <laughs> it's is, is it true? It's not true. It's it's not true. Oh. Since since that interview, we we went out of our way and we have we have implemented said creature. Yeah, although I got I got a little something I had a little something for you in case you uh. <laughs> oh boy! I hadn't done that. I actually got this uh <laughs> this uh, remote control. Rat, and he's actually, uh, you know, animated, oh. so you could have used that. We should have used it. As I, could have, I could still send this to you. Well, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you could. That'd be helpful for Joe when he's yeah. animating it. In eight directions. <laughs> Ooh, well, I'm glad that was... Uh, yeah. Oh, that was awkward. <laughs> yeah, that was awkward for you. Yeah. Not to have that a heart attack. Okay. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a second installment. Got at least uh, one more, maybe two more episodes here with Joe and Hannah. Hope you guys are enjoying that as much as uh, I did. They're really, really fun to talk to. Uh, also, uh, there's a audio interview with uh, uh, Dan from Team 21. That's the Dungeons of Aladorn uh, team. Uh, we tried to do a video. I was going to do a match chat on him. It's just standard Matt chat uh, video Skype uh, setup, but we just, I mean, it was Murphy's Law out the wazoo. Just could not get a video feed going uh, no matter what we tried, and we tried for, you know, hours to get this thing to work. So finally, we just had to compromise and do a, an audio podcast instead. But anyway, it's still good. It's definitely uh, worth uh, listening to if you are at all interested in that uh, Dungeons of Aladorn series. And if you haven't heard about that, uh, game yet, definitely go check out the Kickstarter. I think they've got 13 days left and uh, quite a ways to go, so uh, definitely check that out. Uh, I would describe it as a Legend of Grimrock uh, meets uh, Realms of Arcania, uh, although they said that uh, Betrayal at Crondor is their main inspiration. But, but anyway, it's really, really cool. Definitely go check that out. I think you'll really uh, enjoy that. And I'll put a link to my uh, interview. It's not, it's not up yet, but as soon as it is, I'll put a link on the uh, show notes for you. All right, let's see. Uh, first off, of course, uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much. If you have supported Matt Chat, really means a lot to me, guys. You just have no idea. Uh, thank you very much for your support on uh, Patreon. It's really, really uh, cool of you to do that. And, you know, as always, don't feel bad if uh, all you can uh, support the show with is a, is a dollar or two. Uh, you know, I was just reminded of, that, of this fact when I was talking to a, 
that's a Dan of um, I know they're from the Czech Republic and he was just you know one of the questions that came up was uh, you know how can you guys possibly make a game with just sixty thousand dollars and he uh, kind of let me know really that sixty thousand dollars is a lot of money uh, for him in the Czech Republic you know the wages and salaries are are much different so that just kind of brought it home to me you know and I, I don't want anybody to feel bad uh, that they can only support the show with a dollar you know whatever it is uh, guys I just really really appreciate it uh, so you know thank you for your support really really means a lot okay what about that news from the Matt Cave <laughs> Well, um, beyond the obvious cold symptoms, I don't think anybody's interested in that. Oh, it's been a fun weekend, let me tell you. Trying to play Pillars of Eternity with uh, just snot coming out of uh, both nostrils full blast. It's, it's uh, been interesting. Uh, let's see, what about serious news? Well, starting off here with some very bad news. This is just kind of heartbreaking stuff for me. But uh, the TSI guys, the Seven Dragons Saga Kickstarter, uh, they've decided to cancel that. Uh, I, I didn't write down how long they had it up there, but it was, uh, I guess they felt the time. It just wasn't, I guess they predicted that this wasn't going to make it better to uh, withdraw uh, before letting it run its course. But they uh, managed to raise 106000 uh, but that's pretty uh, short of their 450000 uh, pledge goal. So lots of theories circulating about that, and I, I kind of chimed into that as well, what the problem might have been. But... Anyway, I talked to uh, Dave Shelley today about it, and he said that, you know, don't feel bad. They actually have learned some lessons from doing that Kickstarter, and they plan to do another one. Uh, I don't really have any details about whether it will be a Seven Dragon Saga again or maybe something else or, or what. But anyway, uh, the good news is, though, they're definitely not giving up, and they're going to try something again soon. So, uh, you know, thanks to all who pledged to that. I know it really meant a lot to the uh, TSI team. Okay, and then uh, some other news here. Thamer, a long -term, uh, long-time friend of the show, sent in a link to an Indiegogo-funded project called Icy. Uh, this is not the beverage, although those are, are, are delicious. Uh, no, this is a post-apocalyptic RPG, and it's set in the Ice Age, and it's from a team based in Rome, Italy. So I watched the pitch video for this, and I think it's worth checking out just for the pitch video. It's, it's pretty funny and well done. Uh, so go check that out, and uh, good old Thamer, uh, thanks for sending that in. And let's see, what else? Uh, well, I've already mentioned the Dungeons of Aladorn uh, Kickstarter. Uh, I'm really surprised, you know, they're, they're almost at the halfway point. The way these Kickstarters work, you want to get to about halfway within the first few days because uh, it makes kind of a bucket shape, you know, sort of a, what is that shape, a bowl shape. And then towards the end, you tend to, you know, collect about as much as you did in those first few days. So really, by now, you want to be at the halfway point. They're so close. I mean, it's just painful. Uh, so, you know, go over there and check that out. I guarantee you watch the video, and you're going to be, uh, it, you'll, you'll agree, I think, it's worth, you know, the 15 bucks or whatever they're, uh, they're charging for the digital copy. You know, uh, I think it looks great. I'm really excited about it. But uh, then again, I really like the Legend of Grimrock. <laughs> so I would like to see, uh, see that. And the addition of the tactical combat is even more exciting. So anyway. All right, I think that's going to about do it for the news. That's a lot of news, huh? Uh, what about that ale of the week? Uh, well, I probably should be taking the cold medicine of the week instead of the ale of the week, but whatevs. Uh, this is the Lake Superior Deepwater Black IPA Ale. This is brewed right here in Duluth. Well, not right here, but it's brewed in Duluth, Minnesota, which I believe is about two hours from here. Uh, I've been there a couple times, really beautiful, uh, beautiful place, Duluth. Um, and I guess they must get the, I wonder if they make the ale from the lake water. It doesn't really say. Unfortunately, they don't give any information at all on the bottle. So I don't know what the alcohol content is or anything else. So, you know, <laughs> nothing to do now, I guess, but open this up and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this uh, deep water black IPA here. All right, so I got some of this black water. <laughs> that doesn't sound very. Uh, oh, it's deep water. Oh, sorry, uh, deep water. Yeah, don't drink the black water. 
Deepwater Black IPA Ale <laughs> here in the rather excellent Dreamy Lord. I've been smelling this. It smells uh, really, really nice, actually. Get quite a, uh, some hoppy aromas there. I can even smell that through all the congestion. So, you know, it must be very hoppy. Smells pretty nice. <laughs> Got my uh, neighbor's dog here, Casper. He's, he's been with me during this uh, weekend. Uh, my friend and Ajay, they're out of town, so uh, Casper gets to come over. But <laughs> I don't know what he makes of all of this. Kind of wish I knew I could read a dog's mind. Sure, it would be uh, delightful. Anyway, this uh, smells good, so let's give it a taste. I hope I'll be able to taste it. Wow, that's a uh, really nice uh, flavor on it. You get a lot of a uh, sort of cocoa-like flavor. This is a coffee flavor, uh, but it's not really bitter. It's more sweet than bitter. Uh, kind of a raisin-like taste. I'll try it again here. Just a really good, just a little bit of a metallic flavor to it. That might turn some people off. I uh, actually uh, am fine with it. I kind of uh, like it. <laughs> That's where I get my iron. Uh, it's pretty tasty. I'll try it uh, one more time here. Yeah, all around us are a nice snappy uh, ale there. I really enjoy that. It's uh, uh, not bitter. Uh, just a little bit of sweet. It's got a lot of character to it. Nice uh, body on this. I'm, I'm actually pretty impressed with this. I. I wish I knew how much alcohol there was in there. I don't really know. Does I don't taste any. Um, what is that? <laughs> it's not a very good indicator. Uh, anyway, I guess I'll go well. Four out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, really nice. Uh, really good flavor on this. Uh, you know what can I say? Really good choice. All right, let's uh, wrap this up with a quotation. Now I was looking for quotations about rats. <laughs> it's actually more than you would think. And I found one from Lily Tomlin, uh, although I thought it could, uh, I thought it needed a bit of revision, so I, I tweaked it, I've enhanced it. Uh, but it goes something like this. The great thing about the rat race is that even if you lose, you're still a rat. <laughs> See you guys next week. It's like Freaky Man, real freaky. We're gonna freak out together. I'm way out, man, like the rest of you cats. Hey, man, you're really gross. Yeah.